People are living to be older than ever before, but is that truly the best thing for our society? Hello everyone, my name is Ollie. I'm a third year medical student on the graduate entry programme at Warwick Medical School. So one of the most pressing problems facing the NHS and the wider world is that of our ageing population. What exactly does that mean? Well, ultimately it's going to be best explained by these population pyramid graphs. This one is for the UK in the year 2000, a population of 58 million, broadly equal numbers of males and females at all stages of life, even then, women living longer than men at the very top age brackets. About 1.3% of people are over the age of 80. Fast forward to 2050 and a projected population of 75 million. 15 million more people in just 50 years. 4.3% of men and 5.3% of women are now 80 or over, about 1 in 20 of the population. Relatively fewer people are now in middle age, but the number of infants and very young children is similar to the 2000s. But lastly, as we move ahead to 2100, the distribution is becoming almost uniform. Between 2.5 and 2.9% of the population sit at almost every age bracket. 6.8% of men and 7.2% of women are now 80 or over. That's about 11.5 million people. The population growth is slowing as birth rates lower, parents wait longer to have children and have fewer children per household, as tends to happen in wealthier countries with time. But what does all of this mean for you, me and the NHS? People are living longer, which is fantastic and no one really wants to die, except millennials. Okay, boomer. And it would be nice on some level to think that our loved ones are going to be around forever. But with a limited amount of resources to go around, particularly considering the NHS, this is going to present some pretty serious challenges for our health system if we want to maintain it. To start with, people living longer simply means more people to treat. This is simple enough. You know, in the next hundred years, our population is likely to grow exponentially. However, it is incredibly unlikely that we are going to train exponentially increasing numbers of healthcare workers to deal with them. Doctors, nurses, allied healthcare professionals will simply have more and more people to cope with per head, which by necessity reduces the amount of care and time that each person can receive as an individual. Secondly, the elderly are by no means an easy population to treat they tend to have multiple health problems or comorbidities that arise simply as part of the natural aging process. Heart disease, diabetes, COPD, cancer, kidney disease, high cholesterol, obesity, hypertension, cataracts, and so on and so forth. The rub of it is that modern medical advances have meant that we are able to keep people alive, often artificially, far longer than our ancestral environment for which we are biologically evolved would have ever allowed. And a lot of modern health problems only exist, certainly with the frequency that they do, because our modern lifestyles, which are often excessive, allow them to exist. And living longer also simply means that more diseases are going to arise by chance. More conditions, more complicated and more expensive to deal with. Do we bring down this elderly patient's blood pressure at the risk of completely knackering their kidneys with the drugs that are going to do that? How can we surgically remove this person's tumour if they're too frail to survive the operation? And all of this also means that although we are living longer, the proportion of our lives that we live in good health has to go down. As of right now, in 2019, the latest figures from the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, suggest that a man or woman who reaches the age of 65 can expect to live about half their remaining years in as good health as they've been used to. However, as we continue to age, that proportion will keep coming down. And unfortunately, because women live longer than men on average, they are also disproportionately affected by this. So at this point, it might be useful to discuss the QALY, the Quality Adjusted Life Year. And this is a measurement that's intended to quantify both quality and length of life. And it often informs which treatments patients are going to receive, particularly when we're considering cost. You can talk about qualities achieved per dollar or pound spent. So for reference, one QALY is one year in perfect health. It measures both the length of time and what's called the utility value. So for example, being bedridden permanently is deemed to be 0.5 qualies. It has a utility value of 0.5. So one year of being bedridden is therefore worth half a quali. Equally, if you lived six months in perfect health, 
Again, that comes out to half a quali. Death is worth zero qualies for reference, and quite grimly, it is possible to actually score negative qualies, which would indicate a health state that is thought to be worse than death. Now we're going to talk about dementia, one of the most challenging things for families and society as a whole to deal with. Remember, dementia isn't a single disease, it's a group of different conditions that affect function and cognition. Many of you will have family members with dementia, many of you will know people that do. Not only do these patients require massively increased care because of their loss of cognitive function, but because of their fluctuant cognition, how it changes with time, they often simply lack the capacity to make their own choices or consent to treatment. So this means that either their family or the state might often have to make medical decisions for them, which often ethically speaking can be incredibly difficult, particularly when we're considering treatments that might end up killing them. And remember how demanding situations like this can be for a patient's family. If they care for them themselves, that might mean sacrificing an income that they can no longer bring in to support their own dependents, if they have children, for example. And equally, families might choose to seek a private solution where they can get maybe perceived better care, but these solutions are often incredibly expensive. There is also a really important phenomenon to know about called bed blocking. What this describes is a situation where even if an elderly person is completely compass mentis, you know, mentally sharp, able to make their own decisions, our bodies simply wear out with time and sometimes we might need a bit of help from maybe social care services. So this might involve help with cooking, cleaning, going to the toilet, what we call ADLs, activities of daily living, that most of us take for granted. Social care describes this sort of provision and it's usually provided by the local health authority and therefore the government. But if one of these relatively independent elderly people experiences either a severe illness or a traumatic incident such as a fall, normal protocol would dictate that they were taken to hospital. However, if it's then deemed that this person, when they get better, wouldn't be able to properly cope at home, which might be due to just reduced mobility or function because of whatever they've experienced, they cannot be discharged from hospital until social care packages have been put in place to deal with it. But because of the current social care crisis, massive understaffing, massive underfunding, this can result in patients who are medically well not being able to leave hospital. And they'll occupy those beds for weeks or maybe even months until something can get put in place. It's not their fault and I'm sure they don't want to be there, but the system doesn't allow them to leave for their own safety. And the NHS is particularly vulnerable to this happening during the winter crises, when falls and infections are more likely simply due to the cold weather and A&E admissions tend to be generally higher anyway. And that's not to mention that rapidly changing the environment of a vulnerable or elderly person can actually invoke delirium, which is a state of fluctuant consciousness in which it's likely that the results of any capacity or cognition tests that they receive will actually be much worse than they would be if they were at home. At any rate, many elderly patients end up in residential care or nursing homes that can often be tailored to the particular type of care they need. I remember visiting a fantastic dementia care home during one of my placements as a medical student where all the walls of the common areas were painted to look like a town. And what that meant was that even though these patients had, again, sometimes states of confusion, they didn't really know where they were or what was going on, they had geographic landmarks that they could use to orient themselves and make their way back to their room. So there are small things like that that we know work and are effective in providing particular types of care. So what are we gonna do about all of this ultimately? It's imperative that public spending for care of the elderly goes up. And ultimately that's probably gonna mean that tax contributions have to go up because the amount of money that we're gonna need to spend to deal with this problem is going to exponentially rise as our population rises. But as of right now, our tax contributions aren't exponentially rising. So there's gonna be a problem somewhere. <laughs> We also likely need to train more specialist doctors in care of the elderly or geriatrics as it's sometimes called. And these aren't enormously popular specialties at the moment, so it's likely that we'll have to do something to make these specialist training posts more appealing to trainee doctors. We can't afford for those posts to remain unfilled. And as ever, there needs to be a focus on upstream prevention of chronic long-term conditions like diabetes, COPD, heart disease, the type of thing 
that can be really debilitating for patients and reduces their mobility and function. So that means things like public health campaigns, patient education and public engagement as well. It has to be a two-way street. So there you go guys, there are just some of my thoughts on how the ageing population is going to affect the NHS and a few of the solutions at the end that we can maybe think about in terms of dealing with it. It's a huge problem and something that is in theory only going to get worse at least for a long period of time. So have I missed anything? I'd love to know in the comments whether you think so and I'd love to hear your own ideas on what you think the problems are with this and what you think we might be able to do about it. Thanks very much for watching guys. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel and don't forget to go and check out postgradmedic.com for more free medical school interview videos just like this one. If you want to support the channel guys there are three things you can do. The first one is like, rate, comment, share it with a friend. You can buy me a coffee at the link below on my Ko-Fi page or you can use my referral link to save 10% off your first year of a Complete Anatomy 2020 subscription, my favourite 3D anatomy education tool. Take care and I'll see you next time.